and good morning uh, to all of our viewers. Good morning to our panel. I want to say welcome to the another installment of our week for weeks activity hosted by the Alma Franz Institute for welcome Research and Debate to the, of the Cyprian another College installment of our College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. Today, um, we're going to go into a particularly important discussion. So far, we've had our discussion on the life of George Weeks. We've discussed public-private partnerships. We've discussed public goods. And today, we're going to discuss the idea of just transitions. What do those things mean? What, what does that phrase mean? What does that mean? What does that mean for us? What does it mean for the trade union movement? What does it mean for working people? And I want to thank the Oilfield Workers Trade Union and the Global Labour University for helping us put this panel together this morning. And for all those of you again who are taking part in this session with us. So my name is Akins Vidal. I'm the coordinator for the Alma Francois Institute for Research and Debate, and I will be the moderator for our exercise this morning. And with that, I want to introduce, uh, just tell you a little bit about our session and why we're here. So on the 27th of January in this year, 2021, the Ministry of Planning held a workshop to initiate a stakeholder consultation on just transitions. However, uh, in spite of several major and serious concerns raised by attendees, less than one month later, stakeholders were again invited uh, to a meeting, only this time it was to review a completed draft policy. In this review, it was recognized that a number of the concerns raised had not been addressed. And so in doing that, in, in recognizing or acknowledging that rather, the trade union movement took the opportunity to request from the Ministry of Planning some leave to evaluate this policy and to craft a response. And this exercise is part of that. So we've put together a very, very strong uh, international panel for you, um, complemented by one of our own lecturers to address this issue of just transition. And with that, I want to then open the floor uh, to begin our discussion. We have our first presenter, Ms. Alana Dave, who is joining us from South Africa. Uh, Alana is the Urban Transport Director at the International Transport Workers Federation based in London. Alana leads the ITF Global Program on Public Transport, which includes a number of strategic projects on labor impacts and workers' issues, including the transition from informal to formal employment. She led the development of a global trade union public transport policy to further decent work, formalization, social and climate justice, and gender equality. Alana represents the ITF in external relationships with political decision makers and public transport employers. So with that, uh, Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Ms. Alana Dave to start the ball rolling. Um, thank you so much, Atkins, for that um, introduction and for inviting me to be part of um, the panel. Just to say, I would really love to be speaking from South Africa, but I'm not. I'm in London, which is where the head office of the International Transport Workers Federation is based. Um, but I am from South Africa. Um, what I'm going to be doing is talking about just transition in public transport. Um, and many of you might be wondering, well, are there any issues about just transition? Because public transport is generally seen as a sector that brings many benefits. So I want to look at some of these issues and go beneath the surface to see what the just transition issues are. And I'm going to just share my screen now. Um, um, so so there we are. Um, you can see it. 
So what I'm going to be doing um, just with you today is just to give you a sense of who we are as an organization and why we consider it important to have a whole economy approach to just transition. And then I'm going to look at some of the issues of just transition for workers and for um, passengers who rely on public transport and then link that to the wider, more transformative vision that we have of public transport and which we feel just transition has to be linked to. So um, we are not an organization in all different sectors of transport. I particularly work in public transport, but we also represent workers in maritime, in aviation, in road and in rail and have over 700 affiliated trade unions, including from Trinidad and Tobago. What we've seen in transport is that it's a sector where emissions are still rising. In some cities around the world, it is the sector that is responsible for the highest amount of emissions. But in our perspective on just transition, we feel that we cannot address emissions in transport and reducing in emissions in isolation from other key sectors of the economy. As many of you would probably know just from your own experience and knowledge, the demand for transport arises elsewhere in the economy. And therefore, decarbonization of transport um, is dependent on decarbonization happening in other parts of the economy. So for that reason, we feel it's really important that we look beyond our sector and contribute to the changes that are required elsewhere. And in particular in transport, public transport included, we are a sector that is almost totally dependent on fossil fuels. So we have a very direct interest um, in issues related to energy transformation and energy democracy. So now going on to um, just transition issues for public transport workers. I want to show you this image and this image because these are the kind of portrayals of cities that we're beginning to see more and more of from many governments and in mainstream policy circles. This is the kind of idealistic vision of a smart city. Um, it's presented as integrated, as sustainable, as clean, as healthy, and highly digitalized. But if you look at both those images, there's a complete absence of any human activity of workers who keep cities functioning and moving. So there's no sign of community life or human agency. And what we see partly with public transport, that in this wider kind of model of the smart city. It's seen as a win-win solution, as providing better mobility for the poor, as providing jobs, but also cutting emissions. So that's the dominant narrative. And the message is that the sector has obvious economic benefits and climate benefits, but also social 
benefits. But what we've seen from our experience, and I want to show you now the reality in many cities around the world, that's the kind of, you know, the, on the one hand is the plan, on the other hand is the reality. And what we've seen, um, and perhaps this relates to your experience as well in Trinidad and, um, and Tobago, that where there's a focus on work in public transport, it's about what access to work the service of public transport provides. And there is very little attention paid to transport as an employer. And in fact, transport as a really large, significant global employer, and in some cities, the largest employer. The Sustainable Development Goal 8 focuses on decent work. But when you listen to the discourse on sustainable mobility, there's very little reference to SDG 8 and decent work. And in many cases, particularly in developing cities, the models of public transport that are being introduced assumes job losses rather than job creation, given the number of workers who are in informal employment. So our experience has been that the role of this sector as a source of employment for the urban poor is often a goal of secondary importance. And our experience in the ITF has also been that there's very few institutional settings where workers affected by the transition can discuss and decide their responses and use their skills and knowledge of their jobs to shape the transition and the quality of work in new, improved and expanded public transport systems. So what we've seen in um, public transport is that the shift to clean energy is often displacing and marginalizing workers and often resulting in further privatization of public transport. So we see an emergence and concentration of private companies. And maybe you also know from your own experience of either being in public transport or using public transport, that in many cases, this is not the first transition that workers um, have witnessed. There've been transitions in the past whether it's been from public to private, or formal to informal, or informal to formal, but now another transition to electrified public transport. What we've also seen that already public transport workers are experiencing the direct effects of climate change, that particularly in the global south, workers have very specific needs and understand the impacts because of the largely informal nature of the public transport ser um, um, service. But on the bright side of things, what we've also seen that actually what we do in our cities and towns, there might be more susceptibility to a discourse that focuses on climate and links that to the social and workplace demands of workers. So we feel we must embed a just transition framework in all these changes that are taking place in public transport. As the wider public, as trade unions, we need to be asking questions about the numbers of new jobs that will be created. The impact, questions about the impact that these changes will have on existing jobs. Um, and what strategies there are to create decent jobs with rights and protections. 
including social protection if there are job losses. I also want to raise the issue that we feel is very important in just transition, that if we are looking at contributing to gender equality in a sector like transport, we have to strengthen women's employment because it's a largely male dominated workforce with a proactive set of measures to address occupational segregation and gender equality. So those are just some of the kind of just transition issues that we are beginning to um, focus on and to try and negotiate both with employers, but also to lobby governments on. But what I want to do now is um, focus on just transition as one element of a wider transformation that needs to take place in transport to really guarantee the economic, social and climate benefits. And we as the ITF have developed a comprehensive people's public transport policy with our demands linking workplace issues to wider social issues around mobility. Um, and we believe our role is not only to be in the workplace, but also to be taking positions on ownership, on the control of public transport, on financing of public transport, on the use of technology, and then of course, the bigger issue of decarbonization. Um, so I will, there is a website where you can, as you can see on that slide, where you can access this policy. And we hope that this could be a platform where workers in public transport can link with the wider community and public to really ensure that public transport systems meet the needs of people rather than being run in the interests of private property or private profit. Um, and really just to conclude then, you can see that we have both a, a, a kind of strategies that link to immediate issues and problems, but also a strategy that is about a long-term change. And what we have heard from public transport workers in different cities is that jobs must become formal. There must be a worker-led formalization process. There needs to be good social security coverage, um, job stability, retraining for skills for these new technologies that are being introduced, um, pensions for those that are close to retirement and where there's a possibility of job losses and health and safety standards need to be improved, especially in extreme weather events. But I want to also just look at some of the more transformative issues um, that workers have put forward about public transport systems. And these are workers saying that we need publicly run operators. We must stop the intensification of privatization and the role of private operators in public transport. That we need worker run cooperatives to be given priority in transitions. That the expansion of public transport should not depend on higher fares because otherwise we are entrenching existing inequalities rather than um, improving the right to access to mobility for everyone that the modal shift to public transport, getting people out of their private cars and into public transport is as important, if not more important than technological solutions like electrification. We can't have a technological fix to what the problems are in our mobility systems and we need technology sovereignty 
with some worker control of technology. So just to conclude, um, I don't want people to be left with the idea that this is a very um, unrealistic, abstract set of ideas. These are our policy ideas that have been formulated by workers themselves. And we are actively taking these ideas and their de these demands into the way in which we organize and campaign. And at the moment, a big global campaign, which we're collaborating with the C40 cities on, is a campaign called the Future is Public Transport, where we are looking at just transition as part of a wider campaign to get governments to invest in public transport as part of the recovery um, from COVID-19, but also as, the, as an essential response to dealing with the climate um, crisis that we are all facing. Um, and I encourage, um, you know, those of you who are watching um, this webinar to look at the website for this particular campaign, because this is both about workers, but also about communities and users of public transport. So thanks very much, Atkins. I think I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very, very spirited uh, contribution and a an important one because um, just like what you've presented, Trinidad and Tobago is no different. Transport is central to everything and any uh, thing that affects transport, therefore, affects everything else. Um, and we have not, we just, the last point that you made was perhaps one that would resonate with many of the listeners in terms of the moving people out of their private units into a public transport system that is reliable. Um, I don't know uh, that the just policy, uh, just transition policy that we've presented or that we've been presented with actually addresses any of these issues. And, and that is what we're trying to get at today. How do we dive deeply into this policy document to identify not just where the errors are, but how we can correct them. And I think that you've given us some important questions for us to ask um, as we begin or continue our assessment of this draft document. So thank you very much for that, that presentation. I just want to make a point that um, unfortunately, Alana can't stay with us for the entire um, session, but what we're asking people to do or persons, even as you want to ask a question, please put it in the chat and we will have um, we will have them answered and they will be, the answers will be posted below the recording on YouTube. Okay, so for those of you who want to engage, please continue, continue to share. It's not too late for you to still invite uh, colleagues, comrades, friends um, to take in the session. And as you register and you uh, log into YouTube, you'd have access to the chat where you can then post your questions to any of our panelists. So I want to say again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alana. That was excellent. And we definitely hope that you will be with us again soon because this is a campaign thinking exercise and not a project thinking exercise. So we have to keep going with it and going at it until we get the results that, that we want. So I want to move on now to our next presenter, uh, Ian Daniel. Um, Ian is from uh, Trinidad and Tobago. I think he is in Trinidad and Tobago as well. We'll find out, of course, when he speaks. Uh, Ian is the head of the Labor Studies Department at the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. He has lectured in industrial relations, politics, labor history, sociology, and psychology. He's involved in design and facilitation of specialized and customized training interventions in industrial relations practice, and has been a consultant writer, researcher, local community organizer, mass designer, artist, and poet. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you um, who we often call the heart and soul of Cipriani, uh, 
my friend and comrade, uh, Ian Daniel. Ian, the floor is yours. You need to unmute your mic here. That is usually helpful. Thank you very much. I, I, I was I was inspired by the introduction. I didn't know I was so accomplished, even though I think I wrote the introduction at some point in time. Um, <laughs> Uh, but thank you um, for for including me once again in this discussion. This is a very important um, discussion. The idea of just transitions um, allow me to share my screen um, and get into my presentation. Um, I'm going to look at the idea of just transitions from a, a Caribbean perspective. And the, the point of my presentation is not to look at just transitions in its contemporary um, meaning, but to look at the history of transitions that the Caribbean has experienced, the history of transformations of our society and to look at the way in which um, we have experienced um, transitions in the past. Um, I won't spend a whole lot of time uh, trying to define just transitions because I know Nora is going to go into that in a little bit more detail, but I just established the idea that um, the idea of just, just transitions used to be comes out of the climate um, treaty that was uh, established in the Paris Agreement in 2015. Um, it looks at managing the economic and social transformations that comes about as societies try um, to limit greenhouse gas emissions and the technologies associated with that. And the recognition that for a lot of people, that is going to mean that there will be a need for assistance in relation to finance, te um, technology, and capacity building. Um, and the just transition concept recognizes that, that that's a going to be a heavy lift um, and it's going to affect a lot of people. A lot of the times it's going to affect people that you might not even recognize to be part of that transition process. Oh, um, and so, let's oh, go back there. Yeah, so it's going to involve um, the necessity of dialogue and um, consultation, which Atkins was referring to in our example um, before, despite the fact that um, that dialogue process may have um, lacked a bit of, of uh, completeness, um, it's going to require um, support uh, for economic diversification. And very importantly, in all of the other things that needs to be done, it's going to require a look at social security um, for the, play, the, the, the people who will inevitably be displaced as transition takes place. And one has to recognize that um, Caribbean societies have uh, some degree of challenge where social security um, is concerned. Uh, and so, well, to define the, the, the concept, you know, very simply, the transition is that transformation, that economic and social transformation that takes place. And we have to recognize that that transformation has taken place before. Um, transformations have taken place before, um, like for instance, as societies move from agrarian to industrial. Um, and the idea of just is that it's a value that, that a transition should be fair to all who are involved and all who are um, affected. Um, and, and I guess that is one of the harder things to, to, to ensure that we, we, not only that we are fair, but that we identify all who are involved and all who are affected. So some of the big questions, I think um, Alana referred to some of them in the discussion, some of the big questions about um, the, the, the transition, just transitioning, is um, do the policies reinforce existing and inequalities? Um, and uh, you see the, the, the quote from Pinker talks about inequalities in reference to um, fossil fuel govern governance and employment, but inevitably it means um, inequalities in the wider society. 
um, as you structure your society in relation to, to industries or sectors, um, in relation to the, 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 the um, distribution of wealth, you're going to have um, um, inequalities that will radiate outward throughout the entire society. Um, do those policies transfer biases, biases um, throughout the society um, uh, without actually taking into consideration what are the things that affect, uh, that, that, that drive these inequalities? So like, do you have um, regional differences, um, you know, urban, rural, uh, do you have regional differences that are overlaid by, by something like race or, or class? Um, will these things be affected by these policies? Will, they, will, will the new policies, will the new transitions be affected by these old biases? Um, those are things that have to be considered. And also, um, what about the ripple effects? You, you touch one economy, one, one sector, especially a sector in societies like ours that is so um, important, like fossil fuel. Um, and does that have an impact on other sectors? Does that, will that have an impact on other industries? And you, you need to think of it globally as well, because we don't, well, globalization is so, for, uh, is so taken for granted that we, we don't even talk about it anymore. But if the global fossil fuel in, um, um, economy is touched um, anywhere, um, when you run through supply chains, when you run through the interconnectedness between economies, will, will transitioning in the United States affect um, the the economy in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so these are questions that um, need to be considered. And so this, this, this is one of the, uh, sorry, I keep um, trying to move um, the, the screen here. Yeah, um, the, the challenge of just transition is just that, will replacing fossil fuel, will, will will affecting a transition in your society affect the, the, the legacies of injustice and inequality and, and, and access to power in a society, access to influence in a society? All right. Um, and so the point of my presentation is that in the Caribbean transitions are new. This is, this is not a new thing. This is not a modern thing. Um, the Caribbean uh, is in effect the quintessential transitional society. We were created by the transatlantic trade. Um, we are the, the, the first postmodern people. We came from somewhere and during our, our history have been moving on to other places, to, to where we came from, to uh, all parts of the world. So we are, we are a transitioning society. Um, and so we need to look at the history of, of transitions. We transitioned from uh, colonialism and slavery. We transitioned from you know, single sector economies that Lloyd Best and Carrie Levitt called the, the monocrop economies. And you can, as I say here, choose your, your monocrop because one can conceptually um, look at oil and tourism as, as that kind of single crop economy that, that structured the nature of our economies. We had industrialization by invitation. And we also had structural adjustment in the 80s and 90s, and which continues on today. So we've been uh, a, a constant flow of, um, of transitions in our history. And that history, um, I, 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 the more I look at it, is actually a, a history of unjust transitions. You know, that this is, this is the, the perspective that we come to just transitions from. Um, and let's look at some of those unjust transitions, the transition, Caribbean slavery. Um, you know, there was, there was the, the, the experience of reparations paid for slavery, but that reparation, those reparations were paid to planters. Um, Haiti, 
the, the, the first new world, uh, um, you know, free society, free republic. I mean, what, one of the things that distinguishes it in, in, in global history had to pay reparations to French slave owners. And one wonders if the, the, the size of those reparations were over a, a more than a century, more than $21 billion US, if that had an impact on where his, um, his ET is as a society today. Um, additionally, at the end of British um, um, slavery, uh, British emancipation, um, slave owners were, were given reparations to the tune of $300 billion if we were to convert it today. Not slaves, not the people who were the victims of, of of um, the system, not the people who created the wealth um, in the Caribbean or in colonial Europe, you know. And this is the thing that the, the, the CARICOM Reparations Commission points out, that reparations um, um, took place, but the, the, the people who were, who were the victims of the systems that were transitioned um, from um, remained victims. They were not repaired in any way, and not only that, but those, those legacy issues that, that, that I referred to earlier, the, the injustices, the inequities remained in place um, for over a hundred years. In the, the transition did not change the inherent nature of the system. If a system, an economic, political, or social system is built to be racist, it doesn't make a difference who inhabits it after it will continue to be racist. It will continue to be um, exclusionary and unequal. Um, and so like this is one of the basic unjust transitions that, that the Caribbean has, has experienced. Let's go to unjust transitions, Trinidad and Tobago style, because we have our own unique experiences of that. The first one uh, that is not a complete list, I just wanted to pull out the highlights. The first one that we're looking at is the transition from sugar in Trinidad and Tobago, where our first monocrop was sugar and a substantial amount of the land mass of Trinidad in particular was under um, Carony and Carony 1975 Limited. They were, was eventually the state owned sugar producing um, company which, as we see, um, closed down um, in 2003, and its workers were given voluntary separation packages. Um, but as late as 2018, a large number of the workers were still waiting for their packages. And as the president of the Sugar Owners Union pointed out, um, a, a good quarter of, of the workers who were waiting for their packages died and still haven't received their, their packages of, of residential and um, agricultural land. So how just was that transition? And that's a wound that is still open in our society today. Um, Afra Raymond points out that that process was about converting national assets into private assets, the, the nationally owned land into privately owned land, which connects to the, to the discussion that we had yesterday on, on um, public, public assets, on, on, on the, the ownership of, of public um, assets. And, and so what, what we're seeing here, or what he's pointing out is that as we transition the, 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 the lands of Karini 1975 into private ownership, it, the process continues to be an exploitative one, a, a one that is fraught with inequality, as he put it, um, and that continues to exclude the people who were affected integrally by the transition. Um, our experience of structural adjustment in the 1980s was, was no different. Um, we had the rise of unemployment, decline in, in, in state services, and massive outward migration that, that affected our, our society in ways that, that we continue to experience. Um, some people refer to the 
it is a loss decade. Um, and, and would point out that we still are going through the effects of that decade. So we had the reduction of the state uh, as directed by the, the um, IMF and conditionalities and that our governments um, agreed to with the necessary things to improve our economies. Um, we had privatization, but the effects of those things included um, urbanization, unrestrained um, urbanization, and a lot of urban poverty um, being developed. We had the phenomenon um, of, of barrel children. We're very imaginative in, in describing our problems in Trinidad. Barrel children, children who are waiting for um, you know, the, the, the appearance to send stuff down to them from the US in barrels. Um, we had the, the phenomenon of that we described as children making children because no parents, young people without very without much supervision, um, becoming parents themselves. We had drugs, guns, and gangs, and again, one of the more imaginative concepts that we developed during the time, community leaders, which referred to um, gang leadership, um, and a host of other, other developments, which included um, the armed coup attempt in 1990. Um, and not in the least, we have, you know, the, the very visceral, very pictorial representations of inequality in our society that emerged during that era. We have what we call East Moorings or Laventil, you know, right next to on the other side of the city from West Moorings, um, which is the, the the site of the accumulation of wealth in our society, and some of which is, is built on land that was supposed to be owned by the state, but became private, privately owned through um, unknown processes. Another transition, a more recent transition, is the, the, the end of Petrotrin. Um, and well, you know, uh, uh, that, that one, we're still working through that, but some of the more um, important issues that, that are involved in that is that a lot of what Petrotrin, um, Petrotrin actually made is not going to be, uh, have to be imported like gasoline and diesel, um, important power generation aspects of it. Um, and if they're going to be imported, that means that prices are going to go up at a point in time when wages are going to experience immense downward pressure. And the discussion of ending Petrotrin it, it, um, it was a bizarre one in that um, the, the reasoning behind it seemed to suggest that a lot of the ineffectiveness of, of the, one of the largest state-owned um, um, organizations in, in the commanding height of the economy was the fault of the workers, the fault of, of, uh, of the union. And very little discussion was had, in my opinion, I could be wrong, about the effects of state intervention and, and poor corporate governance. But it was clear that the workers were, were a, a big part of why Petrotrin had to be shut down. And, and this, is, this is an example of the cascade effect of closing down Petrotrin, which, which one could have um, substituted um, currently 1975 for, and it would be unchanged. Uh, because when you when the, one of the strange things about about our our society is that a lot of the economic theory says that our economy is not integrated. The different parts of our economy, especially the commanding heights, don't con contact with or don't feed into other parts of the economy. And you know the truth is that's wrong. Especially in a small island economy, our economy is so integrated that there's no part of it, especially the, the high value part of it that you can touch without affecting every other part, either geographically or in, term, in terms of ownership. So you touch Petrotrin and then that whole spiral of the southern economy um, in Trinidad and Tobago in different communities are affected. The number of people who may work in Petrotrin but who just may work around Petrotrin in different industries are, are affected as well. And this is not just in the formal part of the, of the economy, but the, it is particularly in the informal part of the economy 
which means that it's going to have a, a, an immense impact on women. And if it affects women, it's going to have an immense impact on families in our society. Um, and so, so what, what we're seeing is that, is that there's this entrenched history of inequalities and, and exclusions um, in, in our society. And so you, you come now to the idea of, of um, the oil industry and just transitions and the ability for just transitions in the energy sector to, to, to actually uh, be done positively and to affect the society in a positive way. But our plans for development have, have always revolved around these single large um, energy-based industries, which have no history of absorbing labor um, and which all operate in a way that also does not connect to the, to the rest of the society in, in a formal way. So your, your informal connections uh, become the only way in which um, in which income is, is transitioned from one area to the next. Um, and then you, uh, you know, you take a look at salaries in, the, in, in Trinidad and Tobago, which haven't changed in a long while, to see just how entrenched distribution of wealth is. Um, one must recognize that even when you look at the average salary of $9,000, there are a lot of people who just don't earn salaries. We have a lot of people, sometimes as much as, as 26 to 33 percent of, of Trinidad and Tobago involved in the informal economy for which the concept of salary may not apply. Um, you have a, a minimum wage of, of $2,800. So like ju just how dependable is the idea of an average salary in our society, just how dependable is the, the concept of, uh, of the standard of living, another idea that came up in discussion um, yesterday in our society. And so um, I know that's a lot and have to run through it, but finally, you know, the idea is that if we're going to build justice into transitioning, um, transitioning in, in any process in our society, we have to look at the legacy issues of injustice and address those. We have to make um, structural changes in our, in our society, in our economy to ad ad um, address the issues of injustices. Um, we have to look at an equity and take not only the, the, the development goes seriously, but that issue of social protection has to be dealt with iman imaginatively. Social protection can't be as it tends to be grants that are temporary and connected to, 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 to disasters, but must be universal and participatory in nature. And then we have to address exclusion because our history of social dialogue, especially in Trinidad and Tobago, is, is in, in my opinion, something of a joke. Um, and not only look at it top down, but those on the bottom must take responsibility. We must organize ourselves to become part of social dialogue processes um, to inform any transition um, that takes place in our society. And finally, just to connect to the, to the just transition idea, we have to talk about climate change in ways that make sense to us. Because to the, the average Trinidadian, the idea of, of, of the world getting hotter that in a society that is tropical, that may not connect. But as I was saying in, a, in an, another forum yesterday, if we talk about it in terms of rising sea level, if we talk about it in terms of deforestation, in terms of, 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 of environmental change that we are actually experiencing and not about the need to get rid of oil and natural gas um, just in abstraction, then maybe um, we can make some kind of, of traction 
um, in the discussion locally. And I think that's it for me, Achilles. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that, that presentation, Ian. Um, if you all noticed, Ian said finally twice, and that's because they, they plotted against the moderator <laughs> um, during the session that they'll keep saying finally so that I, I know they're coming to an end, but they really have uh, another 20 minutes to go. So I think that, uh, Ian, thanks. Thanks a lot. That, that was important because they, they, there's two things I want to point out, and I want to make sure that we understand. One, is that the idea of just transitions is not a top-down idea. It actually comes from workers, it comes from trade unions, and it comes from this sector because of the fact that you talk about economic transformation, but we talk about economic transformation without understanding the impact on the human condition. And so if you have an economy that has uh, inequities, where the status quo is unjust, when you make a transition to another kind of economy, you can't transfer those inequities and inequalities into that new space and expect people to rally around you and rally behind you in a situation like that. So if you're talking about transformation, if you're talking climate change, you're talking uh, removal of fossil fuels and so on, then you have to sim simultaneously talk about how is the human condition going to be improved. Um, in Alana's presentation, she also spoke to the question of technology. And these are... These, uh, mythical spaces that are being projected that have no human beings at all, you know, um, and that don't speak to the human condition. So I think that that was particularly important. And those of us listening, I mean, some would remember um, and have very clear memories of the, the older transitional challenges we've had in Trinidad and Tobago, the issue of Petrotrin. Um, Petrotrin has not changed our economy, the, the closing down, it hasn't been affected um, inequalities positively. Our status quo has been maintained. Um, I think Afro's point is critical about uh, privatizing public goods and transferring public wealth into private hands. And those are things that we have to be aware of. And we have to, as a population, as workers, pay more attention to what is going on around us and pay more attention to these conversations because we have to be involved in them. We can't wait until the horse has bolted to come from behind. We really have to get on board with these conversations from the get-go and let people know that we have a voice and that we have a say. So thank you very much again, uh, Ian, for that contribution. So we want to move along now, and we're moving to our next speaker, um, who has never corrected us for the pronunciation of a name, so hopefully it means that we've been saying it correctly all the time. Uh, so Professor Noah Ratzel, uh, who works in Sweden um, and has uh, works in Sweden, lives in Spain, um, originally German. So I, I hope I got that one that one correct. So uh, we have in our group we call her the international lady, right? Um, Professor Axel is a professor emerita at the University of Umeå in Sweden. Her research includes environmental labor studies, gender and ethnicity. Her latest books include Handbook of Environmental Labor Studies, uh, which was done along with uh, Demetrius Stivis and David Uzel. She's a Marxist. She's worked on Marxist feminist theories and struggles today, um, transitional corporations from the standpoint of workers, trade unions, and the green economy. So we have a very, very, uh, I'm really humbled by the, the capacity, the quality of this, this panel today. And I hope that we really sit down and, and take in everything that these uh, esteemed guests have to share with us. So with that, uh, Nora, floor is yours. Nora, don't forget to unmute your mic. Unmuting, of course, unmuting. So thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. You have forgotten growing up in Colombia, though. Very important. <laughs> and OK, I will start sharing my screen, see if that works as it worked before. And uh, OK, so I will be talking about what I call the crisis of life, just transition and workers as agents of change. So it connects very much to what the speakers before have said, although we didn't discuss it before. So it seems to be the general discussion these days. 
Ah, uh, where can I? Oh, I lost my pointer. Here it is. So we start with this image because it's the same place, the same day, but 63 years um, in, in, in separation. So you, it shows you so nicely just in these two pictures what kind of changes we are facing. Uh, what I'm saying comes from several research projects where we interviewed uh, trade unionists in Sweden, in the UK, in Spain, in Brazil, in South Africa, and in India. So I'm not going into the details just to give you a kind of idea where we have been working. Um, I want to do a little introduction into the causes of what is called the climate crisis, just a small one, because I have a little bit of different take on it. So normally what we talk about is emissions and fossil fuels, but there is much more. There is, for instance, mass crop planting. There is mass livestock farming. There is deforestation, and that's not just cutting down trees, but it's also destroying the livelihoods of people who live in those forests. Um, if, you, if we look at numbers, 26% of ice-free land surface is used only for grazing. And of that, 20% is degraded by overgrazing. And it takes between 100 and 100,000 years to regenerate one cubic meter of soil. And the number of years depends on the depth of the soil that is regenerating or not. So the total land in feed crops is 33% of arable land. And deforestation, if we go on like that, we've already cut down 1 billion hectare in 40 years. And in 78 years, there will be no more rainforests on earth. So we tend to talk about climate crisis or climate change on the one hand, and then the pandemia, the pandemia on the other hand, but actually these things are one and the same or they have one and the same source because the demand for wood and minerals and resources from the global north, but also from global south industries degrades those landscapes. And that means that the animals that live there they are driven away from their habitat. They live closer together. They live closer to human beings. And that's how we get the virus. This is what a lithium mine looks like. So if the loss of biodiversity continues in the same way as if it's now, then you know, I can't read that because <laughs> there is some um, there is some text there above. So I don't know the number. Maybe you can see the number of the vertebrates that we're going to lose. But what I can see is that without human influence, it would have taken 11,700 years as opposed to only 150 years for the same amount of vertebrates to become extinct. So to sum that up, we're not just facing a climate crisis with emissions. We're not just facing a biodiversity crisis with the loss of biodiversity. We are experiencing a crisis of life on earth. Any kind of life on earth is threatened. And that happens through all these different elements of production of the way in which we produce according to the profit logic of capital. So all these elements have to, seem, to be seen together if we want to change things. So why am I saying this? You might say, what does this have to do with Trinidad Tobago? So Ian has al already shown us what the effects are and I'm just putting in a little bit here because everybody from Trinidad Tobago will know that better than I do. So sea level rise, when Trinidad Tobago started to measure sea level rise about 20 years ago, it was around 1.6 millimeter per year. And now it's about eight millimeter per year. That means coastal erosion, inundation, loss of agriculture, lands and fisheries, and also health impacts. 
from vector-borne diseases such as yellow fever and dengue fever caused by changes in temperature and seasonal durations. We see reduced precip precipitation um, in the extremely dry season, and at the same time, paradoxically, increased rainfall intensity characterized by very rainy dry season. So what you're facing is simultaneously drought and flood. This means, and that was a very, very short, just mentioning few elements, business as usual is not an option. The idea that if we do nothing, just keep our jobs, keep our industry the way they are, everything will be fine. That's not the case. Things will become even worse if we just keep working and consuming the way we are doing it now. So yes, we need a just transition. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. The just transition was really um, an idea that came at the beginning of the 90s from a guy named Tony Mazzocchi, who was um, uh, a trade unionist of the Oil and Chemical and Atomic Workers International Union in the US. He didn't use the term just transition, but uh, he kind of promoted the idea, the structure. And I want to read some quotes because I think they're very, very um, timely today. So I read the quote. The only way out of the jobs versus environment dilemma, he formulated that already the beginning of the 90s, is to make physicians for workers who lose their jobs in the wake of the country's drastically needed environmental cleanup projects. And I quote that because it's so important uh, to see the provision for workers together with the needed environmental cleanup. So a lot of discussions also within trade unions are about worker security, workers' equality, and that is absolutely necessary and central. But the fact that we also need to um, create justice for nature is often not so much in the center of a lot of discourses. So another quote, which is very timely. Until recently, the environmental movement brushed aside the question of job fears with studies to prove that protecting the environment would create more jobs than it destroyed. This position is not adequate, however. Workers need to hear a more realistic program that provides working people with job and income guarantees. I think that is so central because again, even in the trade union movement, you know, there is the campaign for 100 million climate jobs and so on in different countries, which of course is important, but for the workers having a job now, it's not really a consolation for them or something that makes them happy taking part in the transition when they're told, okay, they're going to be fantastic jobs and you will get one of them. Workers need safety and security now. So one of the trade unions that brings together um, different trade unions policies in Europe is the European Trade Union Confederation. And this is just a little insight into their plan. So uh, in the upper part, you can see the way in which they envisage the way in which um, the way we produce has to change, uh, energy efficiency, new energy sources, electric cars, and all these things. Um, I have a lot of things to discuss with these kind of perspective, but I won't do that now because we don't have the time. I just want to say one thing, that this kind of technological fixes in the area of production has to be thought through really carefully. Just to give one example, for instance, the idea of electric cars being the solution. They're not the solution at all. The batteries are horrendous. The lithium uh, extraction is destroying land, is destroying people's livelihoods. We don't even have enough lithium on the earth in order to produce all the cars that um, trade unions and business think we need to have in the future. So we have to be very 
specific about the way in which we want to deal with the transition also in terms of justice to nature and communities. So I read you another quote from the plan of the ITUC, ETUC. Every government must raise its ambition and determine national development plans, including just transition measures to protect workers, their families and their communities. Yes, essential. But what does that mean? That means that the first criteria to call something a just transition is the minimum that it has to protect workers. That is the minimum. So again, I quote uh, Mazzocchi who said, paying people to make the transition from one kind of economy, from one kind of job to another economy or another job is not welfare, is workers' rights. And what you see in this red bit of the screen is some of the ideas that one could think of measures that would really protect workers, not promise them something for the future, but protect them now at the moment of the transition. Full wages until a comparative job is found, four years of education or training, decent pensions with healthcare for those ready to retire, and develop new labor force capability for the emerging green economy. So in my view, that is the minimum. If that is not done, you cannot talk about a just transition. But there are lots of questions, for instance, that are still open when you do that. So what is going to be produced? For whom? With what kind of skills? How will the transition protect workers and nature? Who are the agents of the transitions? And I've put this caricature there, any questions about your work, ask your supervisor, because protecting worker doesn't do anything to question the power relations at work and outside work. So you still have to ask your supervisor about what to do at work. So I think we have to change the question from how does the transition affect and protect workers to how can workers affect the transition, which is their future? So from workers being the victims of a transition to becoming the agents by transforming production. So we've seen that in the past, just very shortly, the Lucas Aerospace workers, they worked in 17 factories in the UK producing mainly weapons, and uh, a lot of them were going to be closed down for several economic and political reasons. And the trade union said, I quote, instead of gearing up my members to react to management decisions, I was encouraging them to embrace the idea of alternatives to aerospace work. So the workers, the shop floor workers, together with engineers, together with designers, together with trade unionists, in different unions, blue collar unions and white collar unions as they're called. They together created 150 product ideas to produce other things, socially useful things with the same qualifications and even the same resources that they had for producing weapons. They, they also did prototypes, for instance, a bus which can drive on roads and rails. So one could use a thing like that today. But there are also um, initiatives like this today, like for instance, Iron and Earth, a worker-led not-for-profit organization with a mission to empower fossil fuel industry and indigenous workers to build and implement climate solutions. And what I find very important and forward-looking of this initiative is that they map the job sector's forecast as the world pursues decarbonation and resilient objectives across the full value chain spectrum. So not just looking at their own working space, but at the way in which they are positioned in the value chain. And then they want to identify transferable skill sets in the fossil fuel industry that map onto new jobs and skill classifications that will be created in existing industry. So that means 
a second criteria for a just transition and a necessary one that goes a little bit beyond the minimum, workers as agents of the transition. Why? Because workers have the skills, experiences, knowledge to develop alternative kinds of production. They can create socially useful products. They have the imagination. They can create meaningful work because they know what meaningful and not meaningful work is. They can develop workers' capabilities. They can create new forms of production that guarantee equality at work, as the other speakers have also said, gender, ethnicity, race, and between manual and mental work. By the way, manual and mental work, that's how it's called in labor study, but it's a very stupid way of defining work because there is no manual work without your head and there is no mental work without your hand. So you even have to at least work your computer. So, you know, but because it's used and we know that what this means is inequality in terms of wages, respect, and the hierarchical ladder in the work process. So we have to address that as well in the future. And that means workers as researchers. What does that mean? It means that although workers have the skills and capabilities and the imagination to transform production processes, there are also things that need to be developed further. For instance, exploring the relation between work and nature along the value chain. So it's not just about working conditions, which are central, but it's about the way in which any kind of production, in fact, any kind of activity uses transformed nature. You cannot think of anything we do, whatever we do, without understanding that what we do is using transformed nature. So how we transform nature in the future is essential for the way in which we're going to survive. And that means creating a new labor nature relationship where workers are nature's allies and not its enemy. So it's not so fantastic what I'm saying because it's already happening and I'm going to go a bit quickly through that. Everybody knows Chico Mendes, one of the first trade unionists who was fighting for the Amazon and uh, first fighting just for the jobs of rubber tappers, but he realized that he was in fact fighting for humanity or the movement of women farmers in Brazil today where one of her um, leader says, for me, ecology, agroecology is a very basic principle of the rural culture. All the rural people, they practice it because it's necessary. And we know that without biodiversity, we will not survive as a rural person, as a family. So Joaquin Nieto, who was one of the first um, environmental and occupational health secretaries in a trade union, uh, in Comisiones Obreras here in Spain, he had already in the beginning of the 90s a holistic view that he needed to address not just, or the trade unions needed to address not just the climate crisis, but the crisis of life. So the issues he set on the agenda were climate, energy and chemical risk, and everything that had to do with biodiversity and with water. And, on, and they founded the Comisiones Obreras in the 1992, they founded a research institute for the environment. And this exists today. And for instance, uh, in May, 2020, they released this uh, booklet talking about the need that after the pandemic, we need to rebuild respecting the boundaries of environmental sustainability parameters. So just to say some of the points that are in this booklet, no support to contaminating sectors, instead strengthening of the public sector, transport, water, waste management, energy, increasing of social services, health, education, care, localize the economy, create local energy sources. So that creates also jobs and energy where people are living. And also even reduce not only the consumption of energy and water, but also the production of superfluous goods. 
that means an ecological restoration and protection of biodiversity. So just these elements mean that workers have developed here a plan to rebuild the economy, shift work from one sector to other sectors, you know, rethink the whole way in which we produce and consume. And also in order to put more pressure behind their demands to um, create broader coalitions with civil society organizations. So the trade union is in an alliance for climate within, with, together with 400 civil society organizations in Spain. However, this is going very far already, but it is possible to go further. So for instance, Numza from South Africa, and I'm quoting here Dinga Sikwebo, who is um, uh, who was one of or is one of the um, persons who is responsible for environmental policies in Numsa. And he says, I quote, central to the political economy of a just transition is a political commitment to build a socially owned renewable energy sector which is made up of different forms of socialized property, cooperatives, municipal ownership, and socialized parastatals. Such a sector should also ensure the promotion of locally manufactured renewable energy technology. So different parts of the world, but quite some similarities with what I read to you from the Spanish demands and policies. What is important here is to think of new ownership, not just state ownership, for instance, of big industries and corporations, but to scale down ownership to new forms of producing that can be created now, like cooperatives and municipal ownership. So the third criteria for a just transition, the transformative, criteria is collective ownership of the means of production. So changing the relations of production, changing ownership. And that means also changing the mode of production from profit oriented to a production that is useful for humans and non-human nature. That implies learning from and creating cooperatives as one option, learning from farmers and indigenous movements, international solidarity and international cooperation across countries, sectors, and traditions. For instance, these are two organizations or two movements, I have to say, that uh, create cooperatives. The one that you see on the left-hand side is the more traditional one that already started in 1895 and centered on worker-owned production processes, um, horizontal decision-making, equality of everybody who is working, equal wages for everybody who is working, no matter what kind of work they do. And the newer movement, which is called solidarity in economy, and it came from Latin America. And what is different here is it has the same value as the traditional cooperative movement, but it puts a very strong emphasis also on environmental issues, on saving not only people, but saving the relationship between nature and people. So I've talked about indigenous knowledge. So indigenous movements have already also, I don't already or also um, taken up the idea of a just transition. They have been fighting for over 500 years to resist extractivism and the robbing of their lands. You know, when we talk about new economy and perhaps producing less, a lot of people ask, yeah, but what about people in the global south? They have to produce more and so, and partly that is true. But on the other hand, you can also see that people in the global south are not in favor of industrializing the way in which they produce and the way in which they live. So now I don't want to romanticize there, you know, also there is not a homogenous movement of indigenous populations. There are also a lot of 
um, conflicts between different groups, different groups wanting different things like everywhere in the world. But just to take a moment and think, okay, what could one learn from other ways of producing and other ways of thinking about the labor nature relationship? And one example. Nora, you have five, you have five minutes. Okay. Yeah. okay, I have to go. So, one example is the movement of farmers without land. And it has been shown that indigenous people are the best guardians of forests. And here you see, I have this and then the last slide. So here you see um, a map that shows you all the, not all, but many of the conflicts that exist today worldwide where workers are fighting against environmental degradation. So there is a lot of possibilities to join together and work together to transform production. So I'm just summing up here. What is a just transition? The minimum, protecting workers, economic protection, education, and transitioning to environmentally safer production. The necessary element of transition, including workers as agents of change. So I'm not going to read that because I'm going beyond my time. And the third element is the transformative element, changing the mode and the relations of production. There's also a book here that has been created in Europe by a lot of good researchers standing on the side of workers, which has a lot of ideas and concrete suggestions. And you can look at it if you want. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Nora. What we're going to do, and I am, I've asked offline before we started, and I'm going to ask when we're finished, but we're definitely going to try to have Nora back um, to perhaps have her own space to, to discuss this issue and, and ventilate it properly, because you know, in the 20 minutes we have, there's so many things to try to, to cram in. But I, what I want us to take away from, from the presentation now would be a few things. One, that the reason Trinidad and Tobago is this, even discussing uh, just transitions is because we are a hydrocarbon economy. And it therefore arises because there's this question of climate change and commitments that the government has made in the Paris Agreement. And so what is happening now is that we're now being pushed into a discussion on transforming our hydrocarbon economy into a green economy um, when we're nowhere near or prepared to do something like that. And so what we're trying to do with the discussion, I think what Nora identified for us very effectively would be the climate considerations. When you talk about transitioning from a hydrocarbon into a green economy, what are those key uh, considerations? And more importantly, when you're talking about fundamentally transforming the economy, what is gonna happen or what are we talking about as far as the criteria for the just transition? So we're not talking about just transition as some uh, esoteric thing down the road. We're talking about just transitions now. We're talking about how are you protecting workers now while you're transforming the economy. So it's not putting workers and their family and their concerns in an escrow account until you're actually ready to treat with them again when the economy is transformed. But how do you treat with them now in the moment? And finally, that workers have to be drivers of this process. And that is, that is what is so critical. Okay, so I just want to identify as well, we have some, we're not just local, we're regional. So we have some important regional guests with us. We have some guests from, uh, some viewers from Grenada, from St. Lucia, from Guyana, uh, from as far up north as Anguilla joining us. So we want to say thank you for, to all of you all for taking part in this important discussion. So I now want to introduce our final speaker for this session, uh, Dr. Sean Sweeney, who is from Britain. Um, so Dr. Sweeney is director at the International Program on Labor, Climate and Environment at the School for Labor, sorry, School of Labor and Urban Studies, City University of New York. He also coordinates trade unions for energy democracy a global network of 82 unions from 24 countries. The TUED advocates for democratic control and social ownership of energy resources, infrastructure, and options. So uh, with that said, um, 
brothers and sisters who are viewing with us, I, I want to introduce you to our new friend at Cipriani College of Labor and Corporative Studies, uh, Dr. Sean Sweeney. Thank you, Atkins. And thank you, comrades, for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. In a moment, I'm going to share my screen, but a, a couple of opening remarks. I mean, the policies being proposed in Trinidad um, and Tobago around just transition are basically part of a green structural adjustment agenda designed by the IMF and the World Bank. Let's be absolutely clear about it. But it's a little bit less brutal in language at least than it was in the 1980s and 90s when structural adjustment was imposed upon the global south and very with catastrophic consequences. Now the narrative is we're protecting the planet, we need green growth, we need to get away from fossil fuels. That is true. We need to protect the planet. We need to get away from fossil fuels. But the methods being used and proposed are to consolidate the neoliberal attack on government and government control over vital sectors. And you heard from Comrade Alana from the International Transport Workers about how privatization of tr public transport systems is part of that agenda and privatization of energy systems is also part of that. So I'm going to address some points that I made in an article um, a year and a half ago, which I'm going to, if it's okay with you, Hakins, I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, if I can find um, the PowerPoint, I hope I can find it somewhere. That's the trouble with the uh, share the screen. You've got so many tabs open, you never know where it is. I'll find it in a second. Here we go. And I'm going to put that on, if you can bear with me, I'll put that on slideshow and away we go. Okay, comrades, I hope you can see that. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so I'm going to unpack, this is not a very visually interesting slide, to be honest, and I actually can't, I don't seem to be able to, here we go. So this is the article, uh, Weaponizing the Numbers, the Hidden Agenda Behind Subsidies Reform which I think is very pertinent to the current um, situation in Trinidad and Tobago in many countries of the global south. And because it's presented as a pro-climate, defend the environment, it gets a lot of public support uh, because the word subsidy, especially subsidies connected to fossil fuels, sounds very regressive and against the environment. So let's look at this a little bit more closely. So here's the claim that comes from the IMF and not just the IMF, but the United Nations, the various think tanks, the neoliberal policymakers, uh, that subsidies are contributing to climate change because they make fossil fuels um, artificially inexpensive. And if they, the real prices were um, allowed to prevail, then there would be less use of fossil fuels. And that means that the um, emissions will come down. That's the basic position. So here's a great quote, very emotional quote from the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. Taxpayers' money is being used to boost hurricanes, spread droughts, melt glaciers, bleach curls, in, what, in a word, to destroy the world. So in other words, if you think subsidies are maybe in some circumstances a good policy, or makes sense from the point of view of equality, then you are basically want to destroy the world or you're complicit in that agenda. So let's have a look at what's being claimed. In 2017, this made big headlines that the fossil fuel subsidies were 5.2 trillion US dollars per year. This made all the media outlets and everybody the jaw dropping, shock and horror, how can this be? So much subsidies go into fossil fuels and that removing them will reduce fossil fuel use and therefore emissions. So it sounds pretty much case closed until you look a little bit more closely. So the actual producer subsidies that go to oil, coal and gas companies to produce in the form of, uh, uh, to extract and process and refine fossil fuels is quite low. So we're talking of the 5.2 trillion, 18 billion annually, 
which in the context of energy expenditure is actually a very small amount of money. Most years, COVID year 2020 was an exception. Most year it's between one and a half trillion to two trillion US dollars are invested in the energy systems. And most of it goes to fossil fuel um, uh, extraction and et cetera. So a very small fraction is producer subsidies. This is profession, you know, preferential tax treatment, direct budget transfers, corporate welfare for fossil fuel companies. We don't support this, of course, but we have to be get it in context of the whole energy um, financial uh, transactions. So it's not a lot of money for the producer subsidies. So the NGOs a lot of them who really don't like subsidies and feel that subsidies should be removed, say that, well, it's more than that. It's actually, depending on which NGO you look at, it could be as high as $440 billion a year, which is a lot higher. And they, by this, they include any state-owned companies that invest in fossil fuels, they calculate that as a subsidy. So they say 286 billion was invested in 2014, though it must be a subsidy doesn't take into account, of course, that governments invest in a lot of things. They also invest in renewable energy. So investing in something for, as for whatever public need may be um, um, determined is not the same as a subsidy. So it's a, I think we should stick to the IMF data of 18 billion for direct subsidies, but we can maybe, even if it was five times that amount, it still wouldn't amount to very much. So here's, the, here's where it applies to the Trinidad and Tobago and other countries. So the, of the 5.2 trillion, 305 billion are fossil fuels sold below global market price or benchmark price. In other words, whatever those, that, those um, commodities, oil and gas, coal can get on global markets should be the benchmark. And if a government decides, because it may be an oil producing country or a gas producing country, to sell at a lower price, for whatever reason, it could be to legitimize their own rule, or it could be because they feel it's an anti-poverty measure, whatever the reason that um, any, if, for example, if Algeria sells a therm of gas for 25 cents, but it could get 50 cents on the global market for the sale of that gas, the difference, 25 cents, would be factored in as a subsidy. So removing these subsidies, which is I think is what's being proposed in TNT, will actually be, um, um, will erode any countries, especially uh, uh, energy producing countries, right to self-determination to control its own prices. So this is quite a serious uh, development. Now for many years, the global south, the energy producing countries, have argued, have challenged this definition. It's been quite controversial at the, at the level of the IMF, where the Global South is saying, we accept that if you sell, or if we sell to our population below the cost of the production, then that is a subsidy. But if we're selling below the price, the world market price, that is not necessarily a subsidy. So there's a, it sounds like a subtle distinction, but it's actually a very important one because it assumes that if you're producing energy for need, and there are needs, um, of course, there are energy needs, then the cost of the production is the main criteria in terms of determining what is a subsidy or not. But if you're a neoliberal, of course, it's how much you can make, how much money you can make on global markets with these prices. So therein lies the controversy between the two perspectives. So remember, we're talking about 18 billion, let me go back a bit, 18 billion in direct subsidies and 350 billion in consumer subsidies. So how do we get to 5.2 trillion then? Where is that number? Basically it's what they call post-tax commuter consumer subsidies. And that amounts to 4.6 trillion, which is 94% of the 5.2 trillion. And so where does that come from? What is that? And according to the IMF calculations, it's the cost of the externalities of unpriced emissions. So here you have the World Bank and the IMF 
and the neoliberal elite pushing carbon pricing as a way of reducing emissions. They haven't been successful in doing that. Only 18% of global emissions are priced right now. And the average price is about somewhere between 10 and 15 US dollars a ton of the 18% that's priced. So very, that price, 10 or $15 a ton of CO2 is ineffective in terms of moving any investment. So what we've seen, and we've seen it in many struggles across the global south, and we also seen it in with the yellow vest movement in France, is companies are charged for their emissions, let's say $15 a ton of CO2, and they pass that charge on down to end users. So people who use vehicles, who have to who basically heat their homes, whatever the, whatever the use may be, those consumers pay it. This is not enough. The price is too low to drive any changes in investment. It's not going up on a global scale. And it's very, very few emissions in terms of percentages are priced. So workers and the planet end up with the worst possible outcome. We end up paying for the emissions in the form of the carbon price, but the emissions end up in the atmosphere anyway, because many uses of energy are essentially mandatory. We have no control over if you live in where if you live in a rural area in the United States, you have no access to public transport. And that's true of many, many countries. So you need a vehicle. If you drive a taxi for a living, if you drive a truck for a living, and you're an owner operator, you're going to need to pay for gasoline. There is no alternative at this stage. So this approach is, um, is obviously wrong, but what the IMF has done, it's socially regressive, is they've calculated all the CO2 that's generated annually. They put a price on it, probably $30 a, me a metric ton of CO2, and that's where you get the 5.2 trillion. Well, in this case, 4.6 trillion. And it may sound, may sound a bit complicated, but what we're seeing here is what I call weaponizing the numbers. It's basically saying, this is a massive amount of subsidies. You must remove these subsidies to save the climate. And that means raising uh, prices of electricity, the prices of gas, prices of oil. Now, why is this green structural adjustment? And I'll just continue for one or two more minutes, if that's okay. The, first of all, the reform, subsidies reform, eradicates the role of the state in controlling prices. So you cannot, unless you want it to be counted as a subsidy, you cannot say in TNT or Mexico or Venezuela or Bolivia, you can't say we are an oil producing country, we're a gas producing country, we're gonna sell to our people at a lower the market price, global market price. That's, that's their legacy. It's, the, it's part of energy self-determination. You can't, won't be allowed to do that unless you want these uh, prices to show up as subsidies. The other reason, of course, if you have higher energy prices, what the IMF calls the real price of energy, then that makes, that's like a bees around honey for the private sector, because now you know there are no subsidies, so there will be essentially higher profit margins for every liter of gasoline or every, um, every I, whatever unit of energy we're buying from fossil fuels. Now, I hasten to add, this is not a defense of fossil fuels. This is a criticism of the policy of subsidy reform because it advances a neoliberal agenda. Now, let's be real then. 94% of the subsidies, the 5.2 trillion, in other words, 4.6 or whatever it is, trillion dollars, and we're talking back of an envelope estimates here, that the IMF says are subsidies, do not exist. They are conceptual. If carbon dioxide was priced at a certain level, then yes, that would be that would, you know, then you would have a sense of what the subsidy would really be. But because the carbon dioxide is not priced, the subsidies cannot be removed. 
So when they talk about removing subsidies, this subsidy is not even in place. In other words, the full price of carbon does not exist. So this is a, an ideological attack. It's basically saying that if, you know, that fossil fuels are so subsidized that anybody who stands in the way of fossil fuel reform is opposed to fighting climate change. So will removing subsidies reduce emissions? This is, I've dug into this data from the IMF and the World Bank, and there is very little evidence that removing subsidies will make a significant contribution to reducing emissions. You have to dig deep into the IMF papers to find it, but here's one of many quotes I found. Consistent country level models of how fossil fuel use responds to price reform are not yet available on a wide scale. Now, what that means is we don't know, we're guessing that if the prices go up, the use will go down. Now, of course, to some extent that makes sense. But again, if there are no alternative forms of energy, then we, the working class, will end up paying for the same amount of energy and we will not reduce emissions. Now, what we've seen all over the world is massive, massive increases, for example, in private transport systems. We've saw that in Alana's presentation. So how can you have a reform, the same neoliberal reform to reduce subsidies, runs parallel with the same neoliberal reform to cut public transport services and privatize public transport. So all across Latin America and many parts of the global south, railway systems, for example, have been sold off, underfunded, et cetera, et cetera. They've been decapitalized because of the austerity measures imposed by the IMF. So if you really want to reduce emissions, you would provide modern, efficient public transport services you would make sure that electricity is decarbonized through publicly owned renewables and other forms of low carbon energy. And you will then reduce emissions in a serious way. But by raising prices of, of energy, all you do is lead to more social distress for workers. Now, here's where the equity question comes in. 80% of the emissions in the atmosphere were which are causing global warming today were generated by rich countries. Now, of course, things have changed in the last 30 years and countries like China and India and other large developing countries are emitting more, but not more on a per capita basis. But who are the energy generating economies that currently subsidize their oil and gas production? I'll come back to Mexico in a moment. So, they are, for example, among the top countries, the top 20, Iran, Venezuela, Algeria, Bolivia, Indonesia, Pakistan. So subsidy reform in this context will affect the global South disproportionately, while the global North that generated most of the world's emissions will be largely scot-free. So let's go back to Mexico. This is an OECD report from 2017, and it acknowledges that the country's opening up of its markets to foreign producers and distributors, they're referring to energy, has accompanied by the raising of consumer prices for transport fuels and the establishment of higher levels of excise taxes, plus the introduction of a carbon excise tax. This, these reforms were introduced by the neoliberal government of Peña Nieto from 2012 to 2016, Meanwhile, the transport, public transport systems have been cut. Car use has gone up. You've had a growth in emissions. So this has had no effect, no measurable effect on the trajectory of emissions. So what's our approach to conclude? We, sorry, we do not accept, we accept there needs to be, in fact, we support a transition away from fossil fuels. The problem though is fossil fuel dependency, not underpriced energy. Until the neoliberal elite start to tell us that what they're gonna do is make sure that emissions are reduced through a process of planning and a public pathway to reduce emissions, then we should reject price mechanisms approach, such as removing of subsidies. Raising the price will 
not create alternative forms of low carbon energy. This is what the short term pain will become medium term pain and theoretically even long term pain for workers, unless there is alternative energy that can be used by the broader populations in a fossil fuel dependent economy, global economy. So I think to conclude when we the most important thing is the same as all the proposals coming out from the ministry is not to be on the defensive, to know the facts. You are not, we are not opposing climate protection. We want climate protection. We just reject an approach that means that the burden of climate protection falls on our shoulders, but in an ineffective way, but a socially regressive way. In other words, we do not get the emissions reductions. We end up paying more and the working class will suffer. And it will backfire on the neoliberal institutions. We're already seeing that workers perceive that they are the ones who are gonna pay for the transition to a low carbon future. And they are moving away in many countries from this approach, they're fighting this approach. So we have to stand with them in this fight, give them the confidence that there are alternatives. It's a public pathway for energy, a global public goods approach, but we can resist subsidies using forward-looking arguments, subsidy reform using forward-looking arguments, and also mobilizing our members in the movements, in the social movements, in the trade union movement to um, to adopt this agenda, which is progressive, forward-looking, and transformative. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Atkins and comrades. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation, Sean. Um, fantastic as fantastic as usual. You know, um, I, I think that what what is key for us um, here, particularly in Trinidad and Tobago, is for us as workers to understand the importance of data and the importance of being informed and being able to make uh, an argument based on information. So you made a point about the correlation or non-correlation between price and reduced use. Um, between 2010 and 2015, we've knocked off significant amounts of the subsidy already. Um, sorry, between 2015 and now, yeah. We've knocked off a significant, and, and there's no research or there's no paper that has been done to show that we've actually reduced consumption. Um, because those of us who drive on the roads every day, um, I mean, the pandemic, even in the, in the context of a pandemic, the traffic is bumper to bumper. Mm. So it's not that because the fuel is more expensive that people are now leaving their cars home or that people are now more reliant on the public transportation system. So then uh, the rationales for some of what is going on, um, they don't hold water. And I, and I think that that is the important, the important takeaway. And, and um, we have real current present day experiences of this. And therefore, if this is our experience in this moment, um, why are we thinking that it's going to be different 10 years from now, 15 years from now? And I think that that is, is, is particularly important. And also for us as workers to be drivers of these um, activities, as has been articulated by every single one of our presenters. Um, as we see, as we see in the in the Caribbean, you know, you have to mind your business, right? Uh, one of these things that we can't we can't afford is an approach of apathy. So we can't just sit back and allow things to happen around us. And then at some point we we get involved and we get frustrated. Um, you know, so we have to get involved in that policy direction side as well. So thank you very much for that presentation, uh, Sean. So we have a few questions. Um, we're 10 to 11. I know we're supposed to end at 11. So with the permission of the speakers, we're going to go a little bit over if no one has an objection. Um, we have just about five questions. So if we take, if we deal with those five questions, well, we have five questions at this time. We'll deal with those five and um, hopefully that will take us to the to the end, what we're going to ask persons to do is if you, your question is not answered, um, that's OK. We will still uh, send it to the presenters. And at the bottom of the thread, um, on the YouTube thread, we will, in fact, address the, the questions at a later time. So just keep looking at the, um, the video, and we will have the, the answers to all your questions at the bottom of that thread. So our first question goes to uh, Ian, and it uh, 
the question is, how can class consciousness be transitioned for equity of the working class? Okay, who, and, the, and as a part B, I suppose, is who in this country is taking the capitalists to task for this uh, process of transitioning, the way in which we're transitioning? Um, could, you, could you read the first part of the question again? Sure. How can class consciousness be transitioned for the equity of the working class? Um, that's a, a, a kind of strange question, um, if I'm understanding it um, correctly, because, you know, the, the class consciousness is required for you to actually conceptualize the idea of equity for the working class. You, you actually have to recognize the working class as a class that is that requires that that is owed equity in the system. Um, I, I suppose the the um, the way I'm looking at it is, is, is kind of like the more the negative of it is that the absence of class consciousness makes the idea of equity and the idea of the insistence of of equity in transition a much more difficult thing um, to 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 conceive of and to battle. Um, and as the the panel tomorrow will um, will discuss, um, you know the the issue of class consciousness um, is is an important one and one that um, I believe that we've been losing in the 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 structural adjustment battle since the seventies and eighties. Um, a, a big part of that was the the growth of MBAs, the industry of MBAs that, that seem to reproduce the idea of neoliberalism that produced a, a professional class, which was kind of middle to upper class to, uh, um, in the Caribbean with, with, with the idea of upward mobility, who reproduced the ideas of neoliberalism and who, um, as, as you will know, Akin, sit in our classes and, and challenge us on, on, on fundamental ideas of equity for workers in, in a society, um, almost starting from the, the proposition in many instances that, that workers are a burden to an organization and, and, not, and, and not an asset. So in the absence of, of a, a, a profound consciousness um, a profound working class consciousness in the absence of, of a, a shared working class consciousness, it's going to be really hard to, to, to argue just transition from, from, from the very beginning, not much less to say, as Nora did, what the criteria of a just tran transition um, is. Um, and, and so um, it, 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 it's important to, to develop um, working class consciousness. It's necessary to develop working class consciousness, a working class consciousness that embraces um, all of the, the, the working people, not just the members of trade unions, but the people who, who um, are outside of the, the, the umbrella of representation as well, but who will be, who are working people and who will be affected by any transition um, in, in our society, particularly those people who, who um, work in the, in the informal economy. Um, and and what, one of the really interesting things about the informal economy is the way that people who work in the formal economy straddle the um, defense and work in the informal economy as well. Um, but uh, as you have been arguing, we are a society of hustlers. And especially where if you affect um, transportation, if you affect fossil fuel, there are so many groups of working people who will be affected from PH drivers down to the young men on the highway who are trying to um, hustle to, to clean your, your windshield, you know. Um, and, and so the, it, 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 the only way um, for us to, to uh, as the broader working class, um, to affect this transition process is to get involved. We are the ones who will do that. If I can go to the second part of the question now, um, nobody else will do it for us. 
Nobody else will do it for you. The, the state has its particular approach, which is being affected by other interests. Um, you know, the professional classes have their particular interests as well, and they will approach it in, in, in their way. It, it is the working class, the working people who must uh, develop our own understanding of these, these issues and, and not just climate change, but all of the, the issues that affect working people and get involved, you know, in, in representing our interests. I think every presenter has said that um, uh, up till now. Uh, and that, that's all I can say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, my next question is for Nora, and this has to do with um, your comments on the idea of industrialization, particularly in the global south, um, and the uh, impact on climate that an increased industrial industrialization agenda could have in the in the global south. Uh, so the question comes from Brian Kamanzi from South Africa. So we, we're very global now with our audience. Uh, and the question really is, um, notwithstanding that position, how do you then treat with a transition to a green economy um, when we're not producing the elements of renewable uh, energy and then end up in a situation where the global south, because we're not industrialized enough, have to buy all the solar panels and all the other components from the global north. So how do we balance um, that, that condition? I would say industrialization is not like industrialization. So there are different ways of industrializing. And for instance, especially as I quoted, but very, very uh, quickly, uh, especially in South Africa, NUMSA, for instance, was fighting for having the construction of renewables in South Africa, but doing it in a way that the ownership of that industrialization would be in the hands of workers or communities or municipalities or whatever. So the question is not industrialization, in my view, industrialization or not, but what kind of industrialization? How can technologies be developed that are not exploiting nature in a way that it cannot be um, repaired anymore. Because I want to say something, you know, often um, environmental perspectives are accused of, or are actually practicing also a way of, we have to conserve nature, we cannot touch nature. That is not possible. Every way of living of us human beings we are going to transform nature. We are going to produce technologies to make our lives easier. Also the agroecological farmers, which I quoted in my talk, they want to have tractors and so on. It's not like that. Not going back to, you know, we do everything by hand and that gives us a different idea of the world. But the question is who and how, and how do we do it in a way that we are we make an alliance with nature, nature can recover again so that we can consistently transform nature in order to meet our needs without destroying it once and for all as we're doing now. Thank you, thank you very much. So we have, we have another question um, which doesn't speak necessarily to climate or um, climate change, well, I suppose it, it, the, we could argue a social climate change, but with the current pandemic and um, shifting, coming out into this new normal and the, the idea of vaccination, and this is, this is really to get your feedback. Um, how should workers' organizations respond to those instances of uh, mandatory vaccination when uh, some workers may not be so inclined? How, how, do, how, how should uh, employer, um, employer representative organizations respond to that because what is happening in some cases, and the question is from someone in Grenada, um, we do know of a, a, a situation that they are currently dealing with at the St. George's University, um, where some of the workers could lose their employment. So how, what would you suggest, and this is for any one of the panelists, um, what would you suggest as a course of action for um, a workers organization 
uh, around this issue of mandatory vaccination or potential for mandatory vaccination. And maybe Sean could get the ball rolling since he hasn't said anything as yet. And then I see Nora wants to, to weigh in. As I was inclined to dodge that question only because, um, I mean, with the with the sort of the vaccine vaccine apartheid that's going on around the world, and the protocols that were not you know were not kind of respected with the development of the vaccine, there are a lot of I think very um, necessary questions that need to be asked about how the pandemic was handled. I wouldn't want to be in a position of saying you better get vaccinated because public health is at stake. Um, when we we still don't know a lot about the the, you know, the nature of COVID, um, we can we all have an opinion on it. But I, my my conclusion would be that the the idea that wearing a mask and getting vaccinated you're the you're on the side of the angels, and if you don't get vaccinated and you and you you know you have to go around, especially if you have to go and do your job, is is a mistake. It's not a class position. It's um, and it's also one not very rooted empirically uh, in in the science. I think there we will see in years to come and a, um, a lot of uh, PhDs and analyses of what's gone on in the last year and a half around around vaccines. Um, so I'd rather not tell anybody what they should do on this. But we do need it. We need to put the you know rigorous scientific uh, data on the table and to see exactly how governments responded and the sort of panic they went into, not wanting to be blamed. And then say, first of all, I'll just close with this. It was, first of all, it was flattening the curve, the pressure on health systems. Then it was, now we all have to be vaccinated to stop the threat spread of a, of a you know, a COVID-19 uh, virus, which is in, in many ways, not dissimilar from many other viruses in the past. So I think there's a lots to be talked about on this subject from a working class and trade union and socialist point of view, to be honest. Anyway, I'll stop there. And that's a fair position. So yes, Nora, chime in. Yeah, I have a slightly different view. <laughs> uh, for, but first of all, I don't think anybody should be forced to vaccinate. I think that is simply not fair. I mean, whatever, even if it was if we were absolutely sure we, we will never be, that it's a great thing and nothing's gonna to happen to you, nobody can be forced to anything. When I, but I, I have a, a slightly different view from Sean's view because science is never finished, you know? So you have a scientific insight, it will never be the last one. It will, it will always change. But I think we have to apply the precautionary Principle, is that the right English word? Precautionary, you know, you have to take care. So with the knowledge we have now uh, from virologists and epidemiologists is that vaccination will help a lot, you know, to prevent people from being infected. And I know that a lot of people think, is it really different, the COVID thing? Is it not just a, a, a big flu? And I know, people who have died from COVID. I have three friends who have persistent long COVID since six months. They cannot live a normal life. They cannot work. They are young women between 35 and 50. So I have a very close experience. And also, I mean, of course I listen to the science like everybody does, but I have experienced what it means to get COVID. And therefore, I would put all my energy into giving all the signs that we have now and saying, you know, that is what we know now. We will know more. We will always know more in the future, but we cannot wait. It's the same with the climate crisis, you know, where for decades people said, yeah, but we don't know really. Is it really true? You know, we have to be cautious and we have to try to get all the knowledge out in order to um, encourage people to get vaccinated, but never force them. Uh, Ian? Yeah, um, 
I, 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 my position is a, a kind of mixture of both Nora's and, and Sean's because I don't think that their positions are, are, are necessarily opposed. Um, I think that despite your personal um, belief about vaccination, from the time you step across that line into becoming a, a mandatory about it, from the time you start um, overriding people's ability to choose, um, there becomes a, a, a necessity to, to take the, the long view and to, to ensure people against what could happen. Because as both um, Sean and Nora pointed out, um, we don't know. We don't know what the effects of, of, of the vaccines will be 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road. Um, what if there is uh, something new to find? And that thing that is new to find is debilitating to someone that we have mandated, you must take the, the, the vaccine. Um, you know, so I, I think that you have to protect, we, we're looking at protecting the, 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 the public um, interest, but you have to protect the individual interests as well. Um, and that, that crossing, crossing over um, into overriding someone's choice, that's a very, very important line um, that if you do go there, you have to be prepared to, to, to um, look at the consequences of that down the road and ensure that that person, the, the persons whose choice is overridden, um, that they are not, they don't bear the consequences, negative consequences on their own, um, which could result in the future. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, I have one more, one more for now, um, and this this is directed at Nora. And then I would ask perhaps um, all of our panelists to give um, just one minute closing remarks. Um, so, Nora, this one has to do with one of your in your last slide. Um, you spoke about cooperatives. Now, we are the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. So, I know some of my colleagues would have. I uh, got excited hearing you talk about, about cooperatives. Um, as an alternative, as an alternative way for mobilization and organization of workers, uh, could you say a little more about the role that um, expand a bit on your point? Because I know you, you didn't get to finish the slide properly. So if you could just expand a bit on it, of, on the role that the cooperative model would have in uh, securing this just transition as a mechanism for workers to be part of the um, ensuring that the transition is just, let me put it like that. All right, I hope that that, that, that is clear. Yes? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I've done a research project about cooperatives in the UK and Sweden and Spain. So I've looked at how they work. And of course, like any other form of life, they're not without conflicts and contradictions. So, but one thing that is really um, important in terms of the perspective of the transition is that worker owned cooperatives, and I'm talking about them specifically, is that workers who work there are really the ones who decide how to work, with whom to work, what to produce, for whom to produce, to grow if you want to grow, you know, calculate everything uh, in, in terms of prices and, do we need to make a profit? Of course, you also have to have some money always to invest and so on and so forth. Everything is decided by everyone. So there's real democracy there. Also, um, there is uh, equality, you know, in terms of no hierarchies, there is equality of wages. All the cooperatives that I have seen and that I know they are, no matter what you do, if you are doing uh, planning things or if you're just packing things like I did, uh, you know, observing, working as well, you, all, everybody gets the same wage. So it's equality there. It's also a problem, but I'm not going to talk about that because that would be another talk. So I think there are a perspective for a transition because if we say that we have to also change the economic sectors, you know, some sectors, need to close down. So what does that mean? That means there is a perspective of workers developing a way to work where they are the bosses and they can decide what to work and how to work. 
and they can't take into account um, the way in which they transform nature into their working process, which doesn't always happen in cooperatives today. That's one of the results of the research, you know, but there is the possibility. So if we think of um, the transition, not just as, okay, I'm going to work here as a worker and then I'm going to work there as an employed worker, but maybe transform the whole thing and create different ways of working where you are really working in an equal horizontal way and owning the means of production, then I think operatives can be a good and great perspective for the future with all their conflicts and contradictions. Okay, hey, uh, fan fantastic. Um, so I could probably let you lead off and um, give your closing remarks immediately. And then um, you all just take the floor um, and just give us uh, your, your closing remarks. So, you know, you can start. <laughs> just just a one minute, just one minute uh, closing remark. That was my we, closing oh, remark. Oh, that was your closing remark? Okay, I, well, then well, I say one more sentence uh -huh. because I thought it was fantastic. We come from different places, you know, different contexts, different sectors, and we are saying more or less the same thing about uh, the future, you know, with different kinds of emphasis. And that's fantastic. So that's a reason to hope. Definitely. And, and that's one of the things we'll actually talk about tomorrow, because the reason, in our view, a lot of the responses are the same. It's because the problem has the same genesis. And that, that period of global imperialism and colonization has created a global economic system that has wreaked havoc everywhere. Um, and, and therefore, in a lot of pockets, you have responses that are very similar because the root of the problem is, is, is identical. You know, so I, I want to get the other panelists in, in to just give some closing remarks. Ian, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I, I want to say two things um, in closing. One, um, you can't have just transitions. You're not going to have automatically just, just transitions if you don't address the history of unjust transitioning, the, the history of, of in, inequity and inequality in your so society. If that's your foundation and you leave it unchanged, then anything that you build on top of that is going to reflect that foundation. So in, in effect, you have to go um, forwards and backwards at the same time to, uh, to uh, achieve the outcome of justice. Um, and secondly, um, it kind of in relation to one of uh, the, the last questions that you asked, um, who says that industrialization has to look like the United States or like um, England or any European country? Who says that the future that we are transitioning to must have solar panels? Why, why does it not have instead um, a, a different um, um, architecture that, is, that works better, as Nora pointed out, with the climate, with, with the environment that, that, that actually negates the need for energy rather than creates a need for a new form of energy that creates dependence elsewhere. So, so one of the, the problems in, 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 in transitioning and in our history is that we just lack imagination sometimes and, feels, uh, and feel that we must be like someone and consume the things that they consume. Um, as Nora said, maybe we just need to have fewer, fewer things as we create this transition to a, a new society. Thank you. Sean, and the floor is yours to close us off. I don't have any big thoughts um, except to say that I think, you know, this conversation and uh, the comrades who are listening into the conversation, um, you know, are in a part of the world which is hugely important because it, it reflects that, you know, it knows in the spirit of what Ian was saying, it, it has a past that can tell us where we don't want to go and we shouldn't go, as in the experience of colonialism and imperialism. 
but the forward looking i think agenda that can to, can use that experience in a way that that can really drive change is around a, a global public goods agenda and we've seen with covid you know with with the vaccine vaccination apartheid we've seen you know um helen clark the former um, prime minister of new zealand headed a commission that said that all vaccines and and protective equipment should be a global public good that they shouldn't be based on private profit and they certainly shouldn't be based on governments hoarding vaccines and other countries, particularly in the South, not having vaccines. That should apply to technologies and knowledge and experience around climate protection and environmental degradation. How do we stop that? And at the moment, anybody who finds anything that they can sell, they will slap a patent on it and they will restrict its use. And we are in a situation now where we absolutely have to be united and focused on the multilateral institutions and say, COVID taught us a lesson. We need a global public goods approach. We've seen how many trillions of dollars have been generated out of nothing to address the pandemic. And that has a lot to do with the new ch um, changes in macroeconomic theory about mon modern monetary theory and the role of government spending, which we should all be discussing in fora like this. So I think there's a, there's a new narrative emerging which can, can tap in to the horrors of the past and what that experience was in colonialism, imperialism, and turn it into something that can develop something new and revolutionary. So I think this discussion, which is why I'm so enthusiastic about what's being um, done in these in these forums, um, is is part of that new narrative rising. And you know that's why I think we've, you know, a new day is going to dawn on this. And I think the Caribbean region and the global South more broadly have a massive role to play in making sure that happens. I'll stop there. With a thank you to you all. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Sean. Thanks, Nora. Um, Ian Alana, who uh, had to leave us, um, to all those of you who have stayed with us for these last two hours and 15 minutes or so. Um, I think that we have had so far, the week is fantastic, right? We, we've had fantastic panels. Um, all the contributions have been excellent. Uh, there, there really is, uh, there really are uh, no words for me to add to what has already been said. Um, I wanna just say to us that ideas start uh, or change starts with ideas and you must have new ideas if you want to experience a different kind of environment. And, and I think that is what Ian was, was speaking to. So let us use these opportunities to build our knowledge base for us to be able to mobilize better, for us to be able to then uh, put the correct kind of uh, front, if you will, against these, these unjust actions against working people all over the world. We're seeing the connectivities, we're seeing the solidarity uh, discussions. Um, I think nor is the issue of solidarity economies. That is something that we have to start more conversations on, particularly here in the Caribbean, understanding what those spaces are and how they work. Um, because we have a long tradition, we just haven't uh, put the names to some of these things. You know, um, so tomorrow, I hope that you all are available to join us again at 5 p.m. And we look at the impact of radical ideologies and working class institutions in the Caribbean. Um, our panel is going to be uh, include persons from Trinidad and Tobago, Grenada, and Jamaica. So we have a regional panel discussing this idea of radical ideology in, in the region. And I, I assure you that you do not want to miss that. That starts at 5 p.m. Um, if you would like to be added to our mailing list, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, ask for a question. Um, ask for a question. Sorry, ask for our email address um, or post your email address in the chat, and we will be sure to send you an invitation and make sure that you're getting the invitations in real time to all the events that we have. So again, thank you to the Elmer Francois Institute for Research and Debate. Thank you to all the team in the back that you can't see um, who are working hard to make sure that this happens. Um, and thank you again for joining us as we commemorate the life 
and times of our former president general of the Oil Free Workers Trade Union, George Weeks. Uh, thank you to everyone and do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Atkins. Thanks.